September the 3rd, 1939. Great Britain takes its stand against Nazism, and South Africa awakens to the realization that it's war. Parliament is summoned and a new cabinet formed. Some of the ministers are English speaking and some Afrikaans, but they have one thing in common, the determination to crush Hitlerism. At their head is General Smuts. This grand old soldier statesman takes over the reins of premiership and acts immediately. He sends out a call. Before the first notes have passed to an echo, men from cities, towns and villages are striding off to serve the cause of democracy. South Africans are like the people of the other dominions, free and democratic, and they rally strongly to the call when their freedom is menaced. The women are proud of them, and the first parades are held in Mufti, for there are more men than uniforms. This is something quite new they're doing, something they never dreamed they'd have to do. But democracy is threatened, and they're going out to help defend it. The women also answer the call. They are not accustomed to heavy work in South Africa. That is done by native servants. But in wartime, such things are forgotten. Everyone must be self-reliant and do her bit and these women have fitted themselves for important convoy work. At the same time, knitting needles click from the Cape to the Limpopo. Like their sisters across the seas, they are determined that every possible comfort shall be given to the men who go forth to fight for them. Comfort not only in the camp, but also in the tropical areas to the north where the men will take the field. Meantime, hometown training is in full swing. Strenuous hours on the parade ground soon knock them into shape. And when they say goodbye to civvies, they're all set to take a stab at bayonet drill. They've a good eye and plenty of strength. And an extra incentive is given by imagining that those sacks are two European personalities. And we needn't tell you who. After a few weeks of preliminary training, the regiments leave for camp. The men are really in the army now, and will only see their homes on those precious weekends when the sergeant major can spare them. At stations throughout South Africa, they pile into troop trains. No gloomy departures, these. They're off on the first leg of a great safari. If the regimental sign writers are anything to go by, they're out after really big game. At training camps, the men detrain. They already give evidence that they're working on a big job and that they've left their homes to make sure they'll have homes to go back to. Camping is no novelty to these sons of the felt and they take to this new life like ducks to water. Open spaces have always been the Springbok's finest tonic. So with an abundance of good grazing and plenty of exercise, he's soon in the pink of condition. Meanwhile, the wings of the springbuck are sprouting fast, and these fellows are keenly studying the art of control and maneuver of aircraft. South Africa can hold its head high in the sphere of aerial warfare, and these men will soon be teaching a lesson to the ruthless pilots who once found good sport in bombing helpless Abyssinians. But every bomb dropped by South Africa's airmen will be a nail in the coffin of the forces of oppression. Men, however, have no monopoly of the skies, for the women are also lending powerful support. Many of them already have their wings and are capable of piloting air ambulances. They have only one aim, and they blaze it across the sky. The South African Royal Naval Volunteer Reserve has been active in seaward defence since the outbreak of war. In cooperation with the Royal Navy, they have kept ceaseless vigil at the ports, and no ship enters these waters without having dozens of eyes focused upon her. She is held at a respectable distance whilst orders and questions are fired at her master by means of flags and flashes. If it's a friendly ship, it's asked to give an account of itself in a friendly way.
During this time, however, she is kept under the steel noses of the coastal defences, which, by the way, are taking no chances. These little ships are also doing a grand job of work by keeping the sea lanes clear of minefields, such as the one they recently cleaned up off Cape Agullas. If other dangers are lurking under the water in this valuable trade route, South Africa's seaward defence is prepared to deal with them also. Dawn throws its steely light over an African flying field. An icy south wind blows across the felt, cutting into the flesh of these men of the subtropics as they stand in their great coats and full kit. But they don't mind, for the time has come for big scale maneuvers. Sir Pierre van Reinefeldt, Chief of General Staff, watches them as they take the air. Down on the ground, other units are on the move. Motorcycle scouts and armoured cars thunder over country roads as if they were speeding to a real battle. The troops are keen, and good roads and bad are taken in their stride, for these exercises are for machines as well as men. Maneuvers take the regiments miles away from their bases, and troop carriers save the men the fatigue of unnecessary marching in the heat of Africa. When hills are encountered, the powerful trucks just eat them up. This is a region not too plentifully blessed with rain, and the wheels throw up clouds of hot red dust. But the men don't mind. They are learning what they'll have to face on active service. On the way, many tribes of natives are passed. They take little notice of the soldiers and move about quite unafraid, for they know that these uniformed men are their friends. Among the dust-covered troops is a man well known to all lovers of cricket. It's Bruce Mitchell, South Africa's opening bat. And once again, he's helping his side to win. At brigade headquarters, the organization is naturally efficient and well-disciplined but there's a noticeable absence of the imperious heel-clicking of totalitarian states. Preparing for the mock battle, observers are busy with their binoculars. They get the lie of the land and communicate with their comrades behind who draw up accurate fighting maps. There's no trusting to luck in modern warfare. Before any move is made, the command learns the exact nature of every inch of surrounding country. Everything is ready now for the most important part of the soldier's training learning to fight under active service conditions. All the theory they've been taught is now put into practice. Contrast the smartness of these soldiers with the civilians who first turned up for parades. Those long hours of marching and training were not wasted. They know how to do their new job, and they know how to do it quickly. They mount their guns with the precision of seasoned troops, and it's not long before they're all blazing away. many months ago, these lads were engaged in 101 other pursuits. Some were totting up figures in banks, some were school teachers, some were selling gold stocks, and others were working on the mines. But that's all forgotten now. There's only one thing that matters, and that's beating the enemy. The equipment of the South African forces is as up to date as any in the world, and the Bren gun companies are especially strong. This type of weapon is particularly suited to bush warfare and the soldiers have learned to handle it to the maximum of advantage. The guns are easily brought into action and are powerful weapons in attack or defense. When in action, the troops make use of every available inch of cover, and just as they learn to hide themselves, so they're taught to camouflage their guns. A covering net is pulled aside, and another eager barrel is ready for business.
In flatter country, we see a parade of artillery. These batteries have a mighty reputation to live up to. For in the last war, South African guns built up a great tradition. One of the largest artillery camps in the empire is in this dominion, so there's no reason why these gunners should not be equal to the world's finest. A gunner has to be schooled in other matters besides actual firing. And many hours are spent loading and unloading guns from the great trucks that transport them. This is not as spectacular as sending shells flying through the air but it's an equally important part of a gunner's training. The lads just revel in this work. From dawn to dusk, they're at it going through every one of the many routines attached to the job of an artilleryman. Practice makes perfect, and only by hard work can they attain that speed, efficiency and coordination that wins battles. Suddenly there comes a warning. Gas mask drill. Masks are hurriedly pulled on, and then the men prepare for business as usual. These fellows are in tip-top condition now, and if a gun needs moving, it's just a part of the day's work. Those tough rugby matches of peace times have had some effect on their muscles, and now it's tug-of-war, with emphasis on the war. It's no use depending on the native drum for signalling in Africa today, so across wild bush areas, the troops string their field telephones. Out here, there's no operator to put you through. You've got to get the right number yourself and get it mighty quick. To make it harder, delicate howitzers like these are liable to interrupt your conversations. They look so squat and chubby, you'd never think they had any harm in them. But wait till you hear them bark. Yes, when it comes to action, South Africa's guns will make themselves felt. Taking our part in this war, we are not merely defending ourselves, our country, our future. We are also standing by our friends in the Commonwealth of Nations in all loyalty and good faith, as we know they will stand by us. We are doing even more. We are also safeguarding 
that larger tradition of human freedom, of freedom of conscience, of thought, of religion, which is today threatened as never before in the history, in history, by the Nazi menace. That tradition of freedom is the spiritual rock whence we were hewn. We have fought for our freedom in the past. We now go forth as crusaders, as children of the cross, to fight for freedom itself, the freedom of the human spirit, the free choice of the human individual to shape his own life according to the light that God has given him. The world cause of freedom is also our cause, and we shall wage this war for human freedom until God's victory crowns the end. In conclusion, let me just say this one word more. Wherever you may be, whatever you may do, remember that you are South Africans and that our name and honor is in your care. Keep it safe and high. Farewell, my friends, and may God bless you and prosper the right. to the homeland. The docks are filled with men and alongside sturdy kit bags are articles worth their weight in happiness. There's no confusion and the immense task of embarking thousands of men with full kit and arms goes without a hitch. More and more men arrive and kit is piled into stacks that arise like mushrooms all over the quayside. But the men are keen to be off and human chains swiftly swing the kit aboard. The men are loaded with comforts and confidence and as they climb up the gangway into their new home, they already have the stride of victors. Officers stand by as embarkation proceeds, and everything goes according to schedule. They're a cheery crowd, these lads of the felt, and whatever they do, they do with a smile. One of the breeziest of them, ready for the big fight, is ex-heavyweight champion Ben Ford. Many feet tread the few yards of gangway leading from the quay, and many of the men set eyes on a ship for the first time in their lives. Some of them from far up country have not even seen the sea before. In their sun helmets and open necked shirts, they're a fine batch of fighting men. The kind of men you'd like to meet if you were fighting on the same side. Meantime, more troops are arriving bringing with them a cheerfulness as warm as the South African sun. It's a great adventure for these men, and they're thriving on it. They've been doing a lot of foot slogging recently, but once they're on that ship, they'll be at a relief from these route marches. Everything is tackled in the speediest manner and this chain of soldiers gets hundreds of rifles aboard in no time. With cheerful fellows like these under his command, no wonder Colonel Dan Pienaar looks pleased. Lifeboat drill is carried out immediately, but you can't get these men down. Under a flag that spells freedom of the seas, they're ready to sail. Last goodbyes are said, and there isn't a man aboard who isn't proud to be going off to defend his land. And so the fighters of the felt go forth to join those other crusaders who have rallied to the defense of democracy. <laughs> <laughs>